Hi, Madam it's Secretary. It's good to see you in person. Yes. Back Hi. to talking to you on the phone. Very good interview. Thank you. Very professional. Thank you for having you in Los Angeles. Great to Mayor talk to you. Always wonderful coming to California. 2016 has been the craziest year for politics ever. At the beginning of this year, I would have never imagined I'd have the opportunity to talk to all of the leading presidential candidates. And as we approach Election Day, instead of focusing on all the scandal, let's talk a little bit about the substance and some of the key policy issues we're now all deciding. On immigration, one of your biggest issues of all, a real big issue here in Southern California. Very big, very we've big. seen so many supporters, Jamil Shaw, other people coming out to support you on that issue. But we've also talked to people who are American-born right. children who are concerned about their parents being deported. What do you say to those people? Well, it's going to all work out. We're going to have a country. We're going to have people coming into the country legally. We're going to have strong borders because we have to have that. Right now, people are just flowing right through. And we have to have a country again, but it's all going to work out. Number one, if we win this election in November, which I hope and pray we will, that's going to send a message to the Republican Party. Enough with the immigrant bashing. Let's get together and solve this problem. Quit trying to use it for cheap political points. If we take back the Senate, which I think is a real possibility, we will then have a Democratic majority in the Senate to be able to move on immigration reform. If we make gains in the House, that will send a message to the Republican leadership in the House as well. So I think the political winds may be uh, blowing in the right direction. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, just automatically saying, okay, everybody who's here, you're, you're fine, go forward. No, people have to step up. They have to come out of the shadows. They have to be evaluated. Look, if they've committed serious crimes or, you know, they pose a threat to our country, they'll be deported. But the vast majority of immigrants are hardworking, law-abiding. Their children are either born here or still living in their families with their mixed status uh, parents. And they will have to go through some steps. We want them to learn English. We want them to pay a fine because they did come here without documentation. And we want them to get in line uh, to earn their citizenship. I think that's fair. It's what we've done in the past, both Republicans and Democratic presidents. Should there be a pathway to citizenship? Yes, there should, and that should be part of comprehensive immigration reform. And with regard to the 11 million undocumented workers that are in the country right now, just set up an easy way where they can come in the door and get a work visa as long as they've been law abiding. That doesn't jump the line when it comes to citizenship. We call for a place to actually come together and get beyond this crisis of fear and of uh, racial bias. We call for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission so that at the community level we are having an honest discussion about race, ethnicity, and on the issue of the economy and jobs, which is polling as the most important issue, not only to Californians, but of course nationwide, we've heard a lot about your, your public sector job growth plans, including infrastructure improvements. But what about private sector job growth? How will you make it easier for private sector jobs to be created? We, we put forth a very uh, comprehensive plan about that, Alex, because I agree with you. Now, of course, infrastructure jobs will not only employ a lot of people, but also uh, use a lot of private businesses, small, medium, and large, to do engineering and contracting. So public sector investments have a lot of spin-off in the private sector economy. But I've also talked about changing the tax code. I want to do more to help small businesses, which are not being formed and growing at the rate that we need them. To talk about policy more than anything else, I mean, I'd love to stay on policy and you know, cut taxes and do lots of great things and get rid of crime and knock out ISIS and all of the things we have to be doing. That's where I'd rather be focusing my energy. If I could wave a magic wand, I would do away with income tax and corporate tax and replace it with one federal consumption tax. You're right in pointing, it, pointing out that it's regressive at the lower end. Mm -hmm. The way the fair tax deals with it being regressive is it gives everyone in the country a prebate check every month of $200. What does an emergency jobs program look like? And you say that jobs are a human right. What does that actually mean? So, you know, it's not like something we have to invent or figure out. We actually did this before as the solution to the Great Depression in the 1930s. We created an emergency jobs program called 
called a New Deal. Well, we're calling for a Green New Deal, which will solve two crises at once. Number one, the need for good jobs, because the jobs that came back after the Wall Street crash are mostly low-wage, part-time, temporary jobs. So we need good jobs to bring back the productive economy and bring back our manufacturing base. This is sort of the, um, it's the antidote to NAFTA. The temporary ban on Muslims entering this country, uh, huge support in the Republican primary, but some say that that's not constitutional in terms of the First Amendment. How is a religious test constitutional? Well, we're going to find out whether or not it's constitutional, but something's wrong and something's got to be done about it. And I have a lot of friends who are Muslims and they say, Donald, you brought out a point. You have radical Islamic terrorism and it's a terrible situation. What's going on is really horrible and we have a president that won't use the term. He won't even use the term. What do you say to Republicans who say that you're being too politically correct when it comes to terror and ISIS? What you heard today is what works. What they advocate doesn't work. And in fact, as we heard, plays right into the hands of the terrorists. What the terrorists want is for um, our country and the West generally to turn on each other. What LA has done uh, is really a model. And we need more uh, places around the country to pay attention to what works and to just tune out the calls for, you know, hate and mean-spiritedness and um, just keep working the way America works best when we're all in it together. What would you do about ISIS and what would you do about what's happening in Mosul right now? Well, right now, let's keep in mind that in my lifetime, uh, I cannot think of one example where we have involved ourselves in regime change where that has resulted in things being better and not worse. For a foreign policy based on international law and human rights and an end to these catastrophic wars that are actually costing almost half of your income tax, but they're just, you know, creating failed states and worse terrorist threats. You have, more has been said about you than just about anybody on the planet. What, what do you think is the biggest misconception about you that's out there? Well, I think you have many, but I think the biggest is, uh, you know, people think he's a tough guy and, you know, he does great in business and everything, but he's tough. I have a lot of compassion for people. I have a, a lot of heart. I want to take care of people. I, I see the way people are leaving. You know, I, I, I didn't need to do this. This is not the easiest thing to do. I could have had a nice, easy life. I built a great company. I have a wonderful family. But we want to make America great again. And I have great compassion for people. I love people. And I think maybe that would be the biggest misconception. We're going to hire us. We're going to hire a by uh, an administration that is nonpartisan: Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians. I think we've got the opportunity to say, "Hey, come on, here's some leadership. Let's come to let's come to the table and deal with issues that are facing this country." I think that third scenario has the possibility of actually uh, bringing about or doing something. The former two. Electing Trump or Clinton, nothing's going to change. Both candidates are more militarist, more imperialist, and more corporatist than they were four years before. we got to stand up now. This is the Hail Mary moment. It's up to us to lead the way forward. What do you think is the biggest misconception about you that you want voters to know? Oh, there are so many. I don't know where to start. I, you know, I'm just a pretty ordinary, normal person. I am uh, somebody who loves my family, my friends. I feel blessed to have been born in this country, to have all the advantages of great public schools and the opportunities that began opening up to women when I was coming of age. I could not be more grateful. And what drives me, Alex, is that I now have this amazing, beautiful granddaughter. I want them, just like I want every child and grandchild in this country, to feel they have the same opportunities to go as far as their hard work and talent will take them. That's what I want to really strive for. That's what I hope to move our country toward. I want to get over the mean-spiritedness and the finger-pointing. Let's join together. That's when we're at our best. And let's make sure every child has the chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. That's what I want to see for our country. Thank you, sir. I wish I had a time to talk longer with all of the candidates, but I hope you found this a little bit instructive. And I really want to say thank you for coming along with me on this journey. Now it's your turn, your voice, your vote. Get educated and get out there and have your say. We'll see you on election night.